thanks everybody for joining. And uh, today we'd like to welcome Professor Francis Wall, who's the Professor of Applied Mineralogy at the Cambrian School of Mines at the University of Exeter. With a background in mineralogy and geology, Francis started thinking about wider issues of mining after joining the Cambrian School of Mines in 2007. She is now starting a new UKRI Interdisciplinary Circular Economy Center on Technology Metals called met for tech with colleagues from several of the UK universities. And she recently led the SOS Rare and High Tech Outcarb Consortium projects that consider responsible sourcing for critical metals. So with that, we're very happy to welcome Frances Wall and listen to what she has to teach us today about how geologists can help in the role of responsible sourcing for minerals. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. And uh, really, thank you very much for inviting me to talk this morning about one of my favorite subjects. And I think this is a lovely format. Hopefully I'm not going to go on too long and I'm not sure if I'm trying to teach you things, but I think this is a great opportunity to have a discussion because it doesn't matter whether you're into the subject of responsible sourcing and working on it already, or whether, uh, whether you're a geologist even, everybody can have an opinion and something to say about this topic. Okay. So I'm going to take the topic from the point of view that most of us on this call today are indeed geologists. And so I thought, well, you know, it's a hot topic and uh, maybe it's one as geologists, when we hear about it or, or read about it, we think, well, what's that got to do with us? And I'd like, if I want to teach you anything, then <laughs> takeaway message is it's loads to do with us as geologists and lots of exciting and interesting ways that you can think as you're working as a professional geologist that are very much to do with responsible sourcing. So that's why I've given this title. And as Aaron just said, we've had some uh, projects recently that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about a couple of new projects that are just starting. And so in a way, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey with me uh, about the way that I've been thinking about the topic. And then we can discuss that afterwards, of course. And as you can see on this opening slide here, what have I put here? I've put our... Uh, clean technology. So if you want a kind of image about why this topic has come right to the fore now, it, it's about the change to a decarbonized economy, about electrification and electric vehicles, wind turbines, solar panels, all the renewable energy, and also our digital tech that's so much part of our everyday lives. And I think people as a whole really forget that all these things have to start off in the ground, even if they're using recycled materials, all of that, of course, as we well know, started off in the ground. And so that sourcing is really important now and has come right to the fore and people are very interested, uh, I think, more and more in where the, their things come from. So although I say people are very interested, I think in the general public, of course, as the general public, we think about that not very often at all. But every now and again, things hit the headlines, as I'll show in a minute. So when we're getting those things, then a responsible mining is one phrase that we talk about. And I would say that that's simply about maximizing all the positive aspects of mining and minimizing the negative ones. And so that leads to responsible sourcing schemes, which give the insurance that this responsible mining is being done. So what I'm going to do then in this talk is take you through some um, examples of how responsible sourcing is coming about and what I think are the drivers for it at the moment. And then I'm going to spend the time showing you some examples of how you can connect geology and your um, life in exploration, the things you do in exploration through to responsible sourcing. And particularly the really obvious things in there to think about our process mineralogy and maybe less obvious, uh, it, but some research that we've been doing is around using life cycle assessment in responsible exploration. Right, so here's my first slide then, and uh, I've gone straight to a screen grab that's all right from the Amnesty International site. And there's the headline, is my phone powered by child labor? So they want to grab your attention. They uh, haven't gone to car batteries. They've gone to the phones to try and connect individually with people. And uh, uh, you 
might recognize there that's a picture of child labor it's a picture from an amnesty reporter in the democratic republic of congo drc and what's the element that's being mined there you probably already know of course because it's the headline it's the post child for responsible sourcing at the moment that's a mine for cobalt in the drc these are headlines that started coming out several years ago from journalists and organizations like Amnesty International saying that uh, over half of our cobalt's coming out of the DRC and some of it's going into uh, phones, it's batteries in phones, but half of it now is actually going into electric vehicles from last year onwards and more will do in the future. And do you really want your phone or your computer to have child slave labor in its supply chain. And that, that's a big, you know, powerful, emotive headline because who would say anything other than no and be horrified by that. And of course, most cobalt in the world does not come from these kind of mines, but the point is, how do we know? And that's really where responsible sourcing comes in. And so as a result of this, actually, things moved quite quickly and, there are organizations trying to uh, help sort out some of these small scale mines. Of course, all that happens is as the cobalt price goes up, there's like a cobalt rush, maybe like the old gold rushes. People start informal mines alongside the big copper cobalt mines that are running in DRC. And then you get some of these horrible conditions. So people are trying to go in and sort that out. And it's led to big initiatives from people like the um, Global Battery Alliance and the European Battery Alliance, to try and make sure that, that they've got um, supply chains that do not have this kind of um, sourcing in them. Cobalt Institute has a special scheme to try and make sure that it can assure the supply chain, so does the London Metal Exchange. So this was really a big thing in changing the way people look at it. I think there might be someone from DRC on the uh, call this morning, and so a really important point, I think, is, uh, and is that this means don't run away from the DRC but make sure what you do buy from the DRC comes from a responsible mine. I think that's the message in responsible sourcing. And let me take you back a little bit. And I think one of the reasons why the cobalt moved so quickly was because of this issue, which uh, depending on how old you are, you may know lots about, or it might've even started a little bit before your time. And this is about conflict minerals. And again, I'm sorry for the DRC, it was involved in this too. There was conflict, there was a war on the eastern side of the DRC. And if you're um, trying to finance a war, you need some way to get money. And uh, tantalum was becoming really important at the time. Again, it's a mobile phone story to make the small capacitors in mobile phones. People needed to get tantalum. And this is a really super good source on the eastern side of DRC and into Rwanda. And as you see, you can put it in quite small bags. So it's easy to transport around informally. It's easy to smuggle. And so people were financing the wars in the Eastern DRC by this mineral coltan, which is the main ore of tantalum. And alongside that is tin and tungsten, which has the nickname now 3T and plus gold from the area 3TG. And these together are, are often called conflict minerals. And this took years, it took about 10 years to get to the, the top of the agenda and the headlines, but was the first issue that really resulted in legislation from the USA a long time ago. And finally, um, 1st of January this year in Europe as well, to make sure that companies using um, reasonable amounts of these metals know where they come from. And so this again, a big humanitarian issue that's driven the agenda of responsible sourcing. Because I want to show you examples of geology, I'll just take a quick diversion from my drivers and background sec section to say that nowadays, how do we know that things are coming out of responsible mines or um, mines that are not part of the conflict situation anyway in Rwanda or DRC? And the answer is they're all locked in bins like this. Then there's a paper trail, a chain of custody that says where they come from. But there is a geological solution. You can do the forensics of this and find out where things come from and that was done by the German Geological Survey BGR. They put a lot of work into this. You can go and read the paper that's on the, the screen. Of course they had a lot of equipment, could spend a lot of money on it and they came up with this hugely um, 
difficult and uh, involved a, a system where they could use every analytical technique there is. So that was never going to be used out in Africa. Then they slimmed it down to automated mineralogy, like on this image, and some laser ablation, ICPMS. So again, that's quite involved. And so this has never been taken up as the routine system. You need something really super simple. Maybe people are looking at LIBS, I know. You may know whether there's uh, any progress on this, but you need a real super simple um, physical analytical scheme if, you, if you're going to enact it. But this was a good attempt and was used for some of the material. So role for geology straight away, I've managed to get in there. But I think this slide now yeah, uh, reminds me to illustrate why I think responsible sourcing is going to come even more to the top of the agenda for all of us. And that's because of the driven in large measure by the change to a decarbonized economy. So the need for cobalt, lithium, rare earths and all the other specialist metals that go into those technologies. And also driven by the fact that so many countries are import reliant on these specialist metals from other places. Indeed, many countries in the West import reliant for practically all metals on other countries. And this is the map European Union plot of what they say are their critical raw materials what they need, what's economically important, but subject to potential supply disruption because it comes from just one country, maybe even just a few mines in one country. And if you've been looking at that slide then while I'm talking, you can see DRC there in Africa dominates cobalt supply, 59% into the European Union. And you see the tantalum there from the conflict minerals, coltan. But look at China on the right. And that dominates the supply of so many of these critical raw materials for Europe. And as we come out of fossil fuels into a decarbonized economy, that's changing to a metals economy big time. And the whole political landscape of the world changes from the northern countries, which are supplying the fossil fuels into just a few countries in the world, and particularly China, that are supplying the metals for a decarbonized economy. And how clever of China to mine and build up their refineries and smelters and all of the supply chain. That's what they've been busy doing. It's a planned approach. And now the world needs to think about that. And we need a more diversified supply of raw materials. And I think it's fair to say the European Union is very much hanging its hat on responsible sourcing. It's saying get mines going. So geologists go out work, get some more mines going, but make sure that they really hit the top standards of responsible sourcing. Because if you want to compete with China, it that is really hard because they've done so, been so clever and done so well. But if you use this responsible sourcing agenda, that might be a very good way to do it. Okay, and so that sets the background. And if you look at initiatives like Climate Smart Mining from the World Bank, you can see that they're looking at this too and saying there's a tremendous opportunity for countries to supply the future metals we need, but we've got to do it in the right way. And that's why they've got this climate smart mining initiative. So everything on then for us to go forward and produce responsibly mined materials, responsibly sourced materials, which should contribute to the sustainable development goals in the areas in which they're mined, and this is my favorite mapping of sustainable development goals to mining. And you'll see that mining isn't just against one or two of the SDGs, it really affects positively and negatively practically all of the sustainable development goals. So we've got to do stuff that really promotes the SDGs. And that's what responsible sourcing is all about. And here's my list of what a responsible mine then has to do. And I'll leave you to look at that for a minute or two and you see that's quite a long list of things it must make money if it goes bust then everything goes wrong it's got to abide by the laws but do more than that and go to best practice ideally mustn't pollute of course mustn't waste lots of material it's got to be energy efficient as low carbon as possible big targets coming up from the mining companies on that for the future it's got to look after the site and sort it out after it's left it's got to look after the health and safety of the workforce, the well-being and all the local people and keep, keep good communications with all the stakeholders. And you'll probably add some more. And if you want to go and see someone who's really thought it through in great detail, look at the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, 
relatively new scheme that's looked at all of this and will audit a mine on all of those responsible mining factors. And they've got 27 different chapters, so pages for you to read to find out what a responsible mine does. But what's that got to do with geologists then? Let's move on and, and have a look. And on this slide, I've put on the left some of the things that you'll be thinking about if you're going and working as an exploration geologist or doing some research on a deposit and thinking about whether it's going to be economic to mine. And on the right are some of the things pretty much off the list of what a responsible mine has to do. And you'll see that a lot of them, the ones highlighted in yellow, really connect very much to geology. And sometimes we use the term geometallurgy to think how you look forward and model often statistically what the response of an ore deposit will be as it goes into a mine. And that's very much a message of today's talk. Besides the geological approach that we take, often looking at the story of how did an ore deposit form, you know, what's the mineral system, where will we find it? You can look forward and think, how will that deposit perform if it goes into a processing plant? What are all the issues? And very much whether it will be easy to process, you know, what's the resource efficiency going to be? How much energy will it use? How much water? Are there things that are going to be an environmental problem? What's the health and safety issues? That's absolutely part of the geology. And so when we do, the initial geology, if we're on a mine, working on mineral processing and then the extraction, all of that has to be done now with environmental and social factors in mind. And you can start that right from the beginning. So on this slide, I've got some of my favourite deposits. So I work a lot on rare earths. And here's different types of rare earth deposits. Uh, good chance we need to go and find some new rare earth deposits. Neodymium is big news in electric vehicles and wind turbines, for example, in the permanent magnet. And there are lots of deposits that we could look at, and they all have different characteristics, of course, which is geologists we're thinking about all the time, and they affect their responsible sourcing characteristics too. So if you look at mineral sands on the left, they're a byproduct. You can take rare earth and monazite out of there as a byproduct. Are really nice and easy, relatively straightforward to process normally. You could do that tomorrow. But people don't, by and large, because that monazite is quite radioactive and people don't want that radioactivity. So that's a negative factor for responsible sources. Whereas carbonatites are going to have lower radioactivity. Um, they can be quite complex in mineralogy, but they normally have light rare earths. And if we're going out to diversify supply, often it's some of the heavier ones that we want to have in higher quantities too. And you might end up with a lot of cerium waste because no one wants to buy that anymore, etc. So complex mineralogy and some of the alkaline rocks and very low grades and some of these iron absorption deposits. So you can be thinking before you even take a step into the field or a step into an exploration project, what sort of characteristics these ore deposits will have. And this is what we were working on in the high-tech Alcarb project. So we were looking at making new geological models for rare earths in alkaline rocks and carbonatites. And I can give a name check to Charlie Beard, who I think is on the call this morning, so we can ask him questions if you like. And he has finally submitted the paper, which turned into a bit of a magnum opus from his project. And he talked uh, at the Ore Deposits Hub last year about the High Tech Alcarb project and how we are making geological models. So I can't repeat his talk, but I just want to say that on that slide, you see that little bar chart down the bottom? We don't, not going to go into detail today, but we picked out the process mineralogy characteristics so that we could think about how these things would process and try to think about the environmental and processing and uh, responsible sourcing characteristics of our deposits. So that if you come new to this topic, you can quickly assimilate that while you're learning about the geology of the ore deposit. So get responsible sourcing right into your first geomodel is the message. And so off you go and you decide to go off and do exploration. And OK, we talk about responsible mining, but absolutely there's responsible exploration too, and people like PDAC have already thought about this a lot. And so this is a screenshot straight off the PDAC E3 Plus website, where you can go and have a look at a framework for responsible exploration. They've got some very nice toolkits that companies look at, and it uses them to be sure they're doing the right things when they go out into the field to explore. 
And we've got a new research project. So we're looking at that um, framework, of course, but what we're doing in the new Green Peg project, which is a Horizons 2020 um, big consortium project with a variety of partners, is Green Peg overall is developing a new, new toolkit for exploring pegmatites. So lithium and um, uh, NYT uh, pegmatites is what we're looking at, these small deposits and getting some new um, toolkits, new varieties of exploration. And as part of that, what we're doing at Camborne School of Mines is a team of us looking at the environmental characteristics of those exploration projects. So um, what, what are the different characters of the techniques? And we're trying to use a technique called life cycle assessment to actually look at exploring with a helicopter or a drone or on foot. And I don't know whether she's on the call this morning, but my colleague, uh, Kate Taylor-Smith is uh, busy working to figure that out. And actually that's quite complicated, but happy to discuss that uh, afterwards if people are interested. And it's early days in this project, but you can watch and see how we get on with the results. So, far. so let's uh, go out in the field then. This is a nice picture taken by Sam Broom Fenley of uh, exploring for rare earths out in Malawi. And what happens when you're in the project and doing the project, then I'd like to talk a little bit about process mineralogy because this is absolutely part of responsible sourcing and it's something that we as geologists we do we almost do without thinking about it but it's really important you know what will the processing characteristics be we talked about that already in terms of energy and water use and things and I'm just going to uh, illustrate for those people who haven't thought about this particular aspect of geology before by taking three monazites, which are the rare earth phosphate or minerals. And I've got two on the screen here. And on the left, you see the scale of that one from Kangen Kundi. This is um, Prospola's image and a little pretty pinky, um, um, kind of slightly mottled things are the uh, monazite, they're in quartz and barite, so that's going to be quite a tough old rock to crush up, so that's something you can think about. They're about 400 microns, the little crystals there, and if you can compare them with this picture from Mount Weld, which is a rare earth mine in Australia, that's uh, a weathered carbonatite already, and so these crystals are very much intergrown with the weathered products of clay and iron oxide, um, 500 uh, microns across, so they're um, about the same size, but really complicated intergrown. And so to get those out of the rock, you have to use a lot of energy to crush the rock very small and then use the process called flotation, which is quite chemical intensive to get them out. And in Kangen Kundi, that hasn't been um, mined yet. And so the, you'd have to look very carefully and sort out whether you need to use flotation or whether they're more like this deposit here and you can get away with just a physical separation process, which is much cheaper and doesn't use the same chemicals. And this one here has super big monazites. You can see they're more of a centimeter size. This is a deposit also under exploration called Eureka in Namibia. And what they've already run some tests and they can get this just straight out with physical processing, not needing flotation. So if you look at this diagram here, sorry, it's a bit small on your screen, but for both deposits, you'd have to drill, blast, um, probably, uh, oh, and um, dig your deposit out. Then you'd have to do a bit of grinding. And then um, on Mount Weld, you'd have to go by that flotation, chemical intensive process. But on the Eureka one, you can just zoom straight past that and make a concentrate by much easier physical methods. This is really easy, you know, straightforward stuff, but it's absolutely part of responsible sourcing. Okay, so that's an introduction to some process mineralogy. Um, let's go on to our next thing, thinking some more about the environmental um, costs of mines, if you like. And I don't know whether we've got anyone from China on the call this morning. So I've said how you know clever China's been with this planned approach of dominating supply of so many metals. And that absolutely goes for rare earths. But if they have one Achilles heel is that they is that that they really haven't looked after the environment while they've been doing that. So there's been a big environmental cost and there still is. I mean most rare earths that we use today come from China and they've got an awful lot of cleaning up to do. And this is quite an old um, picture from the Daily Mail 
but it's it's my I call it my miserable farmer's picture and you could see the journalists could go out and very quickly find people standing on the edge of that tailings look at that desert behind them it's not the desert it's the edge of the tailings at Bionobo the big rare earth mine and there's you know horrible environmental stories around many of the rare earth mines you can compete on this responsible sourcing territory I don't know if you've read the um, hypertext links there this is one of my favorite hypertext links dailymail.co.uk uh, in China, true cost Britain's clean green wind power experiment pollution disastrous scale. And this is really that article. It wasn't just to be nice to Chinese farmers. It was an anti wind power um, article at the time. So we don't want wind turbines on land in the UK. And of course, if we want these green technologies, we have to be sure. And as geologists right from the beginning, that there aren't horrible stories behind them that will put people off adopting the technologies. Right, so what do you do? How do you show that your mine then is really environmentally uh, friendly and good? Is there a quantitative way of doing it? And the answer is yes. The thing that everybody uses is this technique called life cycle assessment. And what you do there, I haven't got time to go into it in very much uh, detail, but you basically have to define what you're going to assess. So is it uh, the mining stage? Is it the mining and uh, refining and manufacturing and use and maybe waste or recycling life cycle. Do you want to go all the way across? Or are you going to do just the mine separation, chemical treatment, mine to gate, we call that. So that's first of all, define what you want. So you have to define, are you going to do it per kilo of ore or refined element or whatever? And once you've sorted that out, then you work out all the inputs. You probably use a commercial software to do it. And then that will give you the outputs and it'll give you measures of pollution and energy use and global warming potential. So you can see what you get out is as really as good as what you get in. So it's really important that these are standardized and there's a big research area trying to work out how to do this best. There's a whole world, world of research in life cycle assessment. But on our SOS Rare project, Rob Pell got going with this with um, colleagues like Xiaoyu Yan at University of Exeter. And we looked at a um, first of all, a review of what people were doing. And um, this is one of the uh, graphs that features in our article, short article in Elements, if you want a summary of this. And this is, was done in 2014, and it's a life cycle assessment for the mine at Bionobo in China. And what you can take from the height of those graphs, this is showing the greenhouse gas emissions in CO2 equivalents. And first of all, there's a nice story here that we always have a mantra that crushing and grinding of rocks is a really bad and energy intensive thing to do. And so it is, but it's not nearly as bad as trying to dissolve up minerals or smelt them afterwards. So mining, yes, it uses a lot of energy, but if you really wanted to make a difference, it's in this cracking or dissolving up the ore minerals, bastnazite or monazite stage. And you can see there monazite, the phosphate is a much tougher mineral than bastnazite and it's more, uh, takes more energy to dissolve it up, has to be heated. And then you can see there's another step of refining the rare earth. And so by using this life cycle assessment approach, you can actually look at these different steps and model them. And if you standardize your LCA, you can compare mines with each other. But we don't just want to compare mines. We should just be doing it on mining because we're geologists and we're doing exploration and we want to bring this technique into the exploration stage. And that's really what Rob showed in a project that you can do right back at pre-feasibility stage, especially when you've got published information in NI43101 reports, for example, you can start doing life cycle assessment and look forward at what a mine would be like. And once you can do that, of course, you can adjust what your mine would be like to minimize its environmental footprint. And this is a bit of a complicated graph, but this is the kind of thing that we could do just off a of published NI43101. This is for Bear Lodge in the USA, which is a proposed rare earth mining operation. And it had a 45-year um, mine life. And Rob could take those figures and look at all the stages of mining and processing and put those together with the grade of the ore. So the black line on there, the lower that black line, the higher the grade of ore and therefore the lower the environmental footprint of producing from that deposit. 
but you can model that and this is what, what Rob does now in his new company is you can code this in and you can look forward and while you're making your block models to see what the grade is of the ore and um, the tonnage and things and plan your mine you can also plan the mine's environmental footprint too doing this LCA approach. So I think this is a really powerful thing to bring into the exploration stage and we'll see more of this coming. So then coming into the last part of the talk, let's look at the actors, if you like, about what, who's uh, interfacing with who and what we're talking about. And a lot of what we're talking about really, if you think, it, look at that mines ellipse on there, irresponsible mining and responsible sourcing really started off um, from about 2002, I would say, onwards with the big mining companies looking at their image generally and what the people around the mines think of, what do their stakeholders think of them. So that's very much the public, obviously all the government and legislation and the banks and shareholders, you'll think about tailings, dams, initiatives and things are really important controllers now on responsible sourcing. And then, of course, their customers are there looking and they're saying this is an opportunity, I think, for mines to show that they're responsible suppliers. Maybe they can't charge any more money. We can discuss this, but maybe they could be the supplier of choice. And how does this sit, though, with us as consumers? So we can't see the mines that things are coming from. It's much too complicated to see through the supply chain. But certainly consumer activists, who can we see? We can see Apple, we can see VW cars, we can, we can see these, these high profile manufacturers. And then they turn around as a result of that customer feedback, if you like, or pressure, and they have the power to reach right back through their supply chains. Think Tesla, for example, have just been and bought a mine to secure a good supply of some of their metals. And this is really changing the landscape. And it'd be interesting over the next few years, how much is coming down from manufacturers wanting life cycle assessment from the mines, for example, and how much the mining schemes like Irma can penetrate up through the supply chain and keep the initiative on responsible sourcing. So we've got two views then of, I would say, responsible mining and the responsible um, sourcing agenda. And one is what happens around the mine and all the stakeholders there. And mines need to be doing the best thing, don't they? Promoting sustainable development. And I've heard this called a, a service. Your mine has to provide a service while it's running and generate sustainable development, even you know, to live after the end of the mine. And the second one then is this one going along the supply chain. And we can begin to think about that in an even more holistic way what happens after things have left our mine and gone off into the supply chain and start thinking in a more kind of circular economy approach because our metals that we produce are really super sustainable materials, aren't they? They can be used again and again if they're looked after properly. So I think mining is always a bit on the back foot because it's called an extractive industry. And you know, once it's gone, it's gone and it doesn't regenerate. And people think that's inherently bad, but don't be put off, you know, fight back guys. Our metals that we produce are really super sustainable. Once we've produced them, they're not going anywhere unless we send them to waste and put them in landfill. So um, make sure that we want to make sure that they'll really be looked after well. So that's the material stewardship sometimes that's called. So just some fun things then. And um, we've as part of SOS Rare, um, Ed Loy and Rob Pell and um, we, we made these um, this card game and you can find it on sosrare.org and it's a, like a top trumps style game and you can compare different sorts of rare earth deposit you can pretend to be the investor or the customer or whatever and see what are the favorite responsible sourcing factors that you think are most important and just coming to that value chain if you're interested in finding out some more about that i um, had the pleasure to do a lecture in the unesco series with john thompson recently and you can find that online and think where we were talking more about mining in the future and the circular economy ideas. But I think the message for today is it's really important that we think about joining up these value chains. This is one reason why doing the LCAs of deposits and mines is so important. And also think of us as raw materials suppliers. So it's not just the first time that things come out of the ground. As we get better at recycling things, which we'll have to do, then you can be thinking in geological ways about secondary raw materials, about urban mining as well. And I bet some of you will do very well in careers 
doing that too. So here we are then, this is what I think some roles are for geologists in responsible sourcing of metals. We've got to go out there and establish supply chains for these metals we need for decarbonisation. They've got to be diversified and secure, but we can really, while we're doing that, help achieve responsible mining and sourcing, establishing the routes of production that are least expensive environmentally and best socially, as well as being financially viable. And we can really get going to link up to that value chain and make sure we're absolutely part of the solution and the manufacturing uh, routes of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francis. That was a really great talk and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of pertinent things for the geologists here and the, the geoscience focused group uh, uh, in this audience. I think this uh, definitely opens a lot of questions, but also provides a lot of avenues for, for us all to start working on um, basically working in, in this sort of a mindset. So thanks everybody for your participation. And we'll go ahead and get started with the discussion as the questions come in. And Francis, I actually have a question uh, that concerns uh, sort of looking at mine systems on, on the life of mine cycle. And as you know, like in resource geology, it's economics that drives everything. Uh, you know, a rock you have one day can be ore today, but not tomorrow, depending on metal prices. And when you showed the, the uh, grade and the data graph analysis for the Bear Lodge deposit in Canada, um, I see an, a big difference in the, a big decrease in grade over the life of mine. And this must happen in, in every single mine. So how can we account for this big gap in, in profit from a mine as the mine uh, continues towards the end of its, end of its life cycle? Well, I guess, uh, as, yeah, eventually, of course, the mine will close. <laughs> and that, that's, that's another story at any time if the price dips, it uh, could, could close suddenly. But I think what, um, I think what happens when we're doing this LCA analysis and you produce those graphs is that you can produce the graph over time and you can also send that into the block model of the mine. And so it could be that in the future, what makes a mine economic isn't just how much it thinks it'll be able to sell its ore for, its copper or whatever it is. It, it will also have carbon targets and things to meet. And so the trick is to be able to model those in from the beginning as well. So you might actually mine in a different way in the future to keep your, say your carbon footprint below a certain level and so that you'll be able to keep going. And I imagine that people will make these models at stage one. And then as they go through time, they might have to go back and refine you know, their mine plans to keep within the environmental and the economic envelope that will allow them to keep the mine going. So I think they're gonna to need to be flexible with these plans, which is why they'll, they'll sit in the geostatistics and the, and the models. And then you can juggle all of these factors as we get better with handling data. I think they'll be able to juggle all of those factors on a mine. So we'll see more complicated models without just the ore and grade in them, but you can put all these other factors in as well and then hopefully they'll be able to balance that to keep the mine going as long as possible but of course there are many mines where they start off with the processing that works on day one and then, then they will have to run around and try and change it as the characteristics change through time and that's why mines need geologists isn't it and they need to keep up with that planning so that they can really um, make sure that they can stay economic and environmentally friendly I think will be what they have to do in the future. Yeah thanks. <laughs> I like the this idea of uh, having to take into account the entire life cycle of a mine rather than just the first yeah. profitable parts of it. Hallelujah, do you have any, any question? Okay, there is a question in the chat uh, and it's, I will read it to Francis. But first, before I read the question, Francis, thanks for that great talk. And I have a question of my own, but I'll ask it after uh, reading this question from the the audience. So the question is, uh, how is how viable is LCA for metals from initial to exploration to the use and recycling of metal? And how can we make public aware of this? 
how viable is LCA? Yeah, it's absolutely viable. It, 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 you know, it, it's coming in as a technique of choice. If you go into manufacturing, you'll find it's used already a lot. We've maybe been slower to adopt it in mining and of course adopting it in exploration is even newer, but uh, you know, it's, there are lots of researchers and consultancy companies and manufacturing and companies that use it. So yeah, absolutely, it's viable. And I think you'll see it used more and more. I think where, where, it, uh, where, it, where it works really well is when you're using energy or global warming potential figures, because people understand those really easily, but it can also be used and, and certainly is for pollution and things like particulates. And people are even using it. I saw a biodiversity LCA the other day for marine mining and you can use it even for social license issues. And I think then it becomes more obscure as to what message you're trying to get over with the LCA. So it works super well, I think, for the energy side of it. And when you do an LCA, that you there are lots of these figures come out of it. And what I find is I always end up just presenting those global warming potential graphs. And that's only a very small part of the real LCA story but you're talking mainly to other LCA experts. So I think of responsible sourcing, really useful for talking to the experts and the manufacturing supply chain, that's gonna be really important. But if you look at it, what really grabs the headlines, it's those big humanitarian headlines, isn't it? Child labor in cobalt or tantalum financing wars. And I don't think that will change in the responsible sourcing agenda. I don't think people will be standing with placards because the, I don't know, the particulates level from well maybe particulates are an issue but the global warming potential is a you know a little bit more here than it is somewhere else or something so there's that manufacturing supply chain is where LCA comes into its own and I think there'll always be these headline environmental humanitarian issues that have to be taken account of qualitatively in the responsible sourcing agenda so viable but not the whole story. Um, thanks, Francis. Um, Erin, do you want to take the next question or should I ask the question from Ruth? Sure, I can, I can take it. Um, Ruth Miller asks if anyone has ever done an objective ranking of different mines or mining, mining companies globally with respect to their responsible operations so that companies wishing to uh, responsibly source their critical metals uh, can do so. Uh, for example, um, yeah, from, yeah, from Mona's eyes. Yeah, basically, is there a, a resource for comparing um, responsibility of uh, different mining organizations? Yeah, I think if you go and Google responsible mining index, you'll find it's an organization that does exactly that and produce ranks of the companies. So of course, that's the, mostly the bigger companies that go on to there. So Yes is the answer to your question. As I say, I'll say again, responsible mining index, just put that into a search engine, see what you come up with. And then um, for rare earths, particularly there's a rare earths industry association, uh, abbreviated RAIA, and they're taking a life cycle assessment approach um, through their members and trying to develop a standardized LCA so that you can compare rare earth deposits in that way. Uh, there's a thing, and then and then I think in other areas, it's not necessarily the interest of the companies to be really competitive. So you know, it wouldn't be of interest to Raya to say go and buy from this member and not from that member. So they want to show that they're all of a responsible standard. And if you look at things like the copper mark, that's where all the uh, copper producers have got together and, and have put something in there and said it, these. This is the um, the uh, what do you say the, the the mark or the this shows it's the assurance that we, we are responsible suppliers and you can look at what standards we're applying here and then this is what we're doing and so there are different schemes coming in some for particular metals aluminium stewardship initiative that's another good one a very well established one to go and look at and then there are others coming in for particular mines and so things like the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, you could have a look at that one. I showed that, that's the one with 27 different chapters. 
and it, it doesn't aim to put mines in competition or companies in competition with each other, but it aims to make the standards that companies can say, you know, standards of really high um, practice that they, they can say that they meet. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. That's a lot of great resources there. Um, I'll finding them and posting them in the chat. Is oh, I see. Okay, I'm not looking. That's uh, no, that's really really important. Hallelujah. We take the next one. Um, there's a question from Michael, um, which you probably answered uh, partially with the answer you just, that you just gave. But he's asking, how best can we deal with the various national interests or policies when assessing responsible mining? Sorry, say that again. How best can we? deal with the various uh, national interests or policies when oh, we are yes. Oh, yes. Mind. okay yes right that, that's a very good question isn't it yes oh well hmm. okay uh, let me take uh, as a good example that we're just working on at the moment in another project for indonesia let's let's take that as an example so that can really ramp up its nickel production uh, as we nickel is another element that we need for car batteries and some years ago, they made the decision that they weren't going to ship just the ore out of Indonesia because the value, of course, of what you're doing increases from the stage where you have an ore concentrate. If you smelt or refine it, then it's much more valuable. And if you actually have the manufacturing value chain, then it's more valuable again. So they said, right, that's it, no more raw ore. We're going to do the refining in Indonesia and then you can buy the next stage um, product. And that seems to be working, that's what people are doing. And so their national policy has been to retain that in Indonesia. And so that's good from the point of view of the value retention in the country. So that's one part of responsible sourcing. But by and large, most of them mines in Indonesia that they don't really have really, uh, you know, a high governance responsible mining scheme across Indonesia, as I understand it at the moment. And so that's something that they could look at next is, well, OK, so the is being mined here and refined here. But what actually standards are those companies working to? And that, that's the next thing they could do. And that would be an important part of responsible sourcing. Finland actually had a. Uh, uh, a pollution uh, problem on one of its mines and it then set up its own responsible sourcing scheme and you can uh, might be able to find that and have a look at it so there are, is within Finland you can be grade C if you apply by the law and then you can be a grade B or a grade A producer if you do higher level responsible mining practices so some countries have actually bought in that is schemes but, and then others would be, think about, well, Australia, I suppose, is very much promoting and Canada promoting their critical materials production. And they're saying, come to us because we're countries with very good minerals governance. So they're saying, in, well, they're not saying explicitly, of course, but implicitly they're saying, don't go to places like DRC, which have reputations or much poorer levels of governance generally come to us and that's very much a, again a point of national policy that's how they're seeing themselves as suppliers and that, that is the problem for some of the, um, the less rich countries where you don't have the capacity to have a uh, strong level leasing and governance is how how can those mines present themselves responsible suppliers because I think it's really important because you want to develop those resources to uh, for your sustainable development in your countries too. It's an awful lot of national politics and things at the moment, and that, I've gone on for a long time trying to answer that question. You can see that's a hot topic and could be a whole other session sometime. Thanks for that, Francis. Just to add to that, I mean, you spoke about you spoke about the the, the profit goes up as you go with the, along the supply chain. And we do have, I'm living in a country where we have a couple of smelters and refineries, so we do get a product. Um, but I think for me, it's really seeing us moving now from just corporate to getting to manufacturing. So I think that's what we need to work towards, especially in Africa, mm -hmm. having that whole process of from supply of raw materials to getting the final product. So I think in the yeah. future, that's what we really need to, to, to work on and enforce. So Henry is says, I would like to add to that with our arsenal. I don't know if it's arsenal of the soccer team, but it says arsenal of methods. We model all, all grade and mining selection plus all recovery. 
At the mining stage, often the economy of the selective mining is eliminated because engineers do not account for costs in other way than what I call immediate dollars. Example, difficult to impose selective blasting as truly it, is, it costs more immediately. But on the long term, it is not true. So it's more of a comment than a question, I guess. And I think it was going to make more sense if Henry was around to un to sort of comment or. Uh, yes, I, I think I get the, uh, I think I think I've understood that. So it, it's saying that there'll be this short, in the short term, you, you're you running your mind to, uh, you know, to produce what's economic right now. And so I guess in the longer term, then that might mean that overall over the life of the mine, you're, you're not producing as much ore as you might do. So overall it's not as resource efficient and, and therefore not as environmentally friendly as it might be. So that, that's a very good uh, question. I'm not sure quite what the answer to that is, except that I suppose the more that you look forward and do things like um, modeling the overall production from the beginning, then maybe that means that in that more holistic model, you might choose to actually produce some less economically viable stuff it, it sometimes and mix it in in a different way because people will be looking at a performance indicator of overall resource efficiency. So that's how, if you like, from the responsible sourcing end, if a customer said, what's your, it, it, never mind what you're doing today, what's your overall resource efficiency over the 25 years of your mine life at the moment, and you had to give a figure for that, then it might work in a different way. But I have to say that's quite a long shot because it relies on somebody, the investor or customer or somebody wanting that level of uh, information and planning. And I'm not sure that that's in any of the responsible sourcing schemes at the moment, but it's a very interesting detailed mining engineering point. So really good comment. I'm thinking about that. Yeah, thanks, Francis. Um, I just want to take this time moment to say that Hallelujah and I have posted the link to the certificate of attendance. So if you need proof that you've attended an hour, um, or deposits hub seminar for professional development or for your professional uh, organization. You can get that at the link in the chat. We also have a question from, we have about 15 people on YouTube and the questions that are coming, but we have a question from Richard Roth, um, who's on the more technical side of, of uh, mm, process mineralogy. And so he asks, what solutions are there for storage of potentially radioactive waste or tailings products from rare earth processing? And along these lines, what should we do to uh, improve uh, the types and range of minerals and mineralogies that we can actually recover or metals from? Oh, right, okay. Uh, that's a, that's an easy one to answer in, in, in short. It's a complicated one to answer in long, and I'm not sure I'm even really a big expert, but how, right, so that's on the rare earth deposits. I mentioned that mineral sands, for example, would be a really good source, but people don't like them because the monazite there, it has two to 10 weight percent um, thorium in it, so it's radioactive. So what are you going to do with that? And many rare earth deposits will have some small amounts of thorium and uranium in. And the answer is that there are people in the world who are really used to storing radioactive wastes, of course, all the, the nuclear um, business and uranium mining, they're, they're used to, to doing that. And so that, that there's expertise there to use. But the real answer, of course, is to not make it waste. So here's a circular economy answer is to find something to do with it. And we think of uranium as the fuel for nuclear reactors, but you can use thorium as a fuel for nuclear reactors. And in India, they keep their thorium because they're interested potentially in doing that. So the real answer is to use it. Thorium reactors are inherently more safe than uranium reactors. I see people talking about small scale nuclear reactors and things for the future. So maybe the answer, please, could you just go and research on thorium as a fuel for that? And then your waste becomes something really useful and you take away the problem. So that's the first one. And second one was, how do we get better at processing different sorts of minerals? Hooray, research people, research for geologists, mineralogists and mineral processors all working together. So collaborative interdisciplinary research to have we we know about funny minerals in strange rocks if you're a um, geologist you know working on these things and we need to get together with mineral processor colleagues to have a look at how we process them 
because you know almost all minerals are processable if we can find the right techniques to do it but obviously it needs the investment in the research and innovation to be able to do that and i just wanted to give a plug sorry shameless plug if you're interested in uh, some of these issues around we've got a free online technology metals for a green future mooc if you just google that it should come up or go and have a look at our university of extra pages and uh, that talks about some of these kind of issues. So it's a you know, nice, lively way with some little films and pictures of refining, some nice films of refining and so on to look at the value chain of things. And it's completely free to sign up and it's open all the time now. Sorry, next question. No, thanks, Francis. I, uh, I can try to find this link. Oh, yeah, put... sorry, now you've got to go yeah. and find that one too. That, that's okay. I think the, um, the resources that you've you've mentioned here and talked about today can be important for a lot of us. Um, so the next question goes back to sort of what we were talking about and what Henri was talking about in terms of profit and economics. And as we are running into the, to the end of, of the discussion time, uh, I'd like to invite any last questions uh, at this moment, but uh, we'll, we'll have time for a few more. And this question is by John Taylor. And he says uh, that he's totally in agreement with the ideas that you're putting forward, but won't this all push up the cost of minerals significantly and then the end cost of, of, of the resulting consumer products? And how, how can we deal with that? Like what, are we yeah. willing to pay that price? <laughs> Well, I don't know. Are we willing to pay that price? We, we're buying these products. Would you pay a bit more for something because it, it's responsibly sourced? And I think so far, the answer from most folks would be probably no. They buy the phone because it's got a great camera or whatever it is that they're, they're buying, you know. Um, but actually, having said that, I think that in electric vehicles, then it is a big Deal because the, the early adopters of electric cars are more likely to be the customers who might ask those kind of questions or we don't think to ask those questions when we go in the car showroom but they might have spotted headline about cobalt and be horrified by what sits behind their car so it's a slightly different issue that they'll, they'll do that and no they won't want to pay any more money and that's the problem isn't it that people want responsibly source things but because um it's not obvious in what you're buying as to what all the components are, then it's very difficult to actually charge a premium. While I'm saying that, I'm thinking that things like responsibly sourced coffee, so fair trade coffee, people will pay a little bit of a premium or some people will pay a bit of a premium for that. But I think generally the challenge in mining is we've been getting very good at economies of scale and producing things really cheap, haven't we? I mean, uh, and manufacturers are used to paying those prices and they won't want to pay very much more for anything that's responsibly sourced. But these, this is why I think the issue is really important at the moment because it's coming much faster now than I've seen in maybe the 10 years that I've been watching the agenda. And companies are actually turning around and saying, we're responsible suppliers, come and buy from us. And it's going to be really important in things like lithium and cobalt, where production is ramping up and new mines are coming online. And so it will be if not some kind of USP or a selling point for those mines. They will have to show that they're responsible sourcing suppliers. Whether they can charge any more, don't really know. Jury's out will be difficult. They will have to compete on price. So it's an extra thing for people to do. But I, I think that now the manufacturers are looking for responsibly sourced uh, metals and so they're more likely to buy it or make you the supplier of choice even if you can't charge very much more money for it and just the last part to that answer is to say imagine that you did have to charge more say for your rare earths um, to make it a responsible supply you know operating to best practice well actually the cost of rare earths in a mobile phone or, or in a car is only a very very small part of what you're paying so if the manufacturers paid a bit more, it wouldn't actually make that diff much difference to the price. So in certain key things that are in the headlines, it's even possible that the miners will be able to charge slightly higher prices because it makes a, a difference to what the, um, the seller, the manufacturer of the car can say 
at the end. So headlines like cobalt, rare earth, lithium, they might be the ones where you're most likely, I guess, to be able to charge a premium. That's a really great question, and a really big challenge, I think, for the industry. Absolutely. We actually have a comment from Leslie Logan. Uh, she would like to, to join the discussion on this. Leslie, can, you can unmute yourself if you like. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Francis, for a really nice presentation. I just thought what you were saying was really interesting because I'm also, uh, I've been thinking about this recently. Um, we've been, I've been in a research ethics course, and we actually read your article in Elements. And uh, I just wanted to say that I also was wondering that I think if you include other stakeholders, such as policymakers, um, then the end price for the consumer can potentially be offset if policy was put in place for like subsidizing um, sustainable metals and things like this. So I just had this idea that I wanted to share that I, I think also if you look at the bigger picture, um, that if governments and policymakers are willing to prioritize uh, these initiatives, which it seems like the ball is rolling that way, then maybe also you would have in a sense, some sort of subsidiza subsidization that, that happens mm -hmm. with these products. Yes. Yeah, good comment. So it's a very interesting topic to think about, isn't it? So are you go, what are you going to do? Are you going to leave it to the market? Are you going to subsidize or are you going to regulate? So that's what happened in conflict minerals is it was decided, you know, to pass laws, regulations that people have to check where their materials coming from and it will be interesting to see how that goes forward and whether there's regulations that you need to check other environmental factors on the sourcing of materials as well or whether it's left more open to the market or whether there's certain to subsidize is quite hard because in Europe it's called state aid and uh, the governments can't um, just finance companies directly so that's a bit of a problem because of the competition rules but certainly the regulatory environment I would say is really important in encouraging responsible sourcing and I think that you will see things come in and you can already see really fierce regulations coming in new from the European Union around the recovery of material from batteries for example and not letting these specialist metals go to waste after we've used them in a few years time, we'll have to be much, much better at catching them at end of life and making sure they're, they're not going into landfill or anything at that stage. And how much that comes in in the future to apply to the beginning of the supply chain, then uh, we'll see. So I think all people who are interested in the topic and can come up with good ideas, the better. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Leslie, and thanks, uh, thanks, Francis, for the answer. Uh, I guess while we're on this topic, maybe it makes sense to invite uh, Holger Pollock to, to to ask his question quickly because this is again a, a end end product question. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks. I was just thinking that I should uh, maybe jump into this topic and uh, show my fair phone and uh, ask Francis what what she thinks about. Uh, the concept of uh, having uh, components, at least of this uh, product, um, sourced by from responsible um, sourcing yep. in, in terms of tungsten and uh, cobalt and tantalum. I think there are just a few of them, but um, yeah, I personally think it's a great step in the right direction. But uh, maybe you can add some perspective. Uh, yes, actually, I took Fairphone off my slide today, so sorry about that. If I had known, I would have left it on. So Fairphone, then for people who haven't heard of it, is a company in Holland. And this is from, from the um, tantalum, from the conflict minerals agenda. They, they got going to say you can buy a phone which won't have conflict minerals in the capacitor in your phone. And then they got really interested in the whole idea of responsible sourcing and where their chips are made in Korea and... Um, and they're gradually working through where their other raw, raw materials are coming from. But since you have about two thirds of the periodic table in a smartphone, it's a big deal. So it's taking them a while, but lots of people go to research with them. And the, the other point they make is that we have our phones and then, then five minutes later, the company is saying, why don't you have an upgrade and have the latest, even whizzier phone than the whizzy one you've got already? So we're very 
bad at hanging on to them for very long. And every year or couple of years, we turn them over and buy a new one. So they said, have a phone which is modular and then you can upgrade it. You can buy a better camera when you need it. The back comes off, you know, you, you can take components out and put them in. So it's really different, very different idea to Apple who say, just get our latest phone, send it back to us. We've got a robot we'll recycle. A really interesting business model. I had a fair phone too. I finally got fed up with it because I couldn't do the upgrades very well. And I went and bought a second hand phone. So I, I kept me in the circular economy, but had to give up on Fairphone. So maybe I'll get a Fairphone 4 or something when they get onto that one and, and get going. So really interesting concept. Uh, and that's, but it's a real serious concept. I think this business, um, first of all, the responsible sourcing, you can see the rest of the world is beginning to catch up with them. So well done on that for highlighting it. You know, everybody in this area knows Fairphone. And then the second thing that's really important to think about everybody is how long do you keep your phone for? And would you go with a business model for your car or your phone or anything else where you can get it upgraded by the company without having to buy a new one? Because that's the problem. There's this business about going and buying new things all the time. And it's a very important part of circular economy thinking is how do you upgrade things? And it, I think that is what Fairphone are very brave in tackling it. And I'm not sure as a customer myself that they got it quite right yet, but mm -hmm. they're certainly on the way and, you know, a trailblazer in making people think about this. So well done, Fairphone. Yeah, very interesting. Go There we are. There's another link <laughs> that Aaron can go and try and find. You just search on Fairphone. It will pop up really quickly. People can go and have a look. If, but maybe maybe it's it's uh, worth, worth a point that uh, um, the, the tiny bit of tungsten that goes into a, a, a phone in general um, is actually partly from Austria uh, in that particular case, uh, since uh, Austria is one of the two yeah. European countries that has uh, some sort of tungsten mining. Mm -hmm. um, they actually have the tungsten that goes into, I think the, it's the vibrator or something, yes. um, sourced from, from uh, Austria. Um, so that's partly from the mine here in Austria and partly yeah. from uh, um, small scale mining in, in Rwanda that uh, shipped their ore to yeah. the processing plant in Austria. So I think they really do put a lot of effort into tracing back the yeah. atoms to, to, to where they actually come from. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I, I must admit I bought a, bought a Fairphone 3 because <laughs> I got fed up with my Fairphone 2. So I'm not quite sure if, they, if it worked so perfectly for me with the, with the circular and the modular. But uh, hey, the number three works really well for me, so I yeah, can good. honestly good. promote uh, and and uh, encourage you to get back on the Fairphone side. That's when, right, when get back comes. on the Fairphone truck. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got to keep my other one for a while now. <laughs> that's really, I didn't know about the Austrian tungsten, and that's so that's really great. And it's another point, really, for us Europeans where we forgot about mining and we're happy to buy from other places. How much of our raw materials can we mine actually at home? in future and I think we need to think about that if we want to use these materials are we prepared to um, be digging them out of the ground as well you know and I, I think to do that obviously the, the standards are, are very high but that's uh, you know I think we need to take our share of mining and there's certainly opportunities in Europe on some of these critical raw materials yeah, so nice point great thanks thanks Olga and thanks Francis and, uh... We can we can uh, shamelessly promote Fairphone. I think it's a good it's a good uh, company to promote. Um, as we wrap up, I'll turn to Hallelujah for probably what will be our last question, um, and and I'll let her ask that. There's actually a comment uh, which I agree with because I'm coming from Africa and we have a lot of artisanal artisanal mine, mining happening here. So John Taylor is saying cutting out artisanal mining is taking away the living of people of many people in Africa. Surely. It'd be better to help to make these artisanal miners to be more aware of and improve their health and safety and also look at the environmental awareness. So he's saying that Western countries should be able to help these miners who are making a living out of this mining. So instead of burning or taking away this, uh, these rights of these African people to do artisanal mining, let's help them improve their health and safety and also understand the environmental awareness. And I totally agree with this point. I live in Namibia. We have a lot of a lot of these people, artisanal miners, and they make a living out of it. So if you take away this from 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 the local people, then again, number one, you're increasing uh, the poverty. People are able to sort of sustain their living uh, conditions. So 
Instead, let's help them. Let's make them understand the health and safety in, that comes with artisanal mining. Yeah, of course, I have to agree 100% with that. And I think that's really important part about responsible sourcing. When people first see the headlines, the, the first thing is, oh, let's not buy from Rwanda in case anything's coming from DRC. Let's not buy from DRC. And that's not really the answer at all, is it? Because there are people there who are relying on producing minerals for their livelihood, as you just said. So the answer is, let's get responsible supply chains into these countries. That's what people like Fairphone have been doing. It's what people like Google are doing. It's what people like Apple are doing. They're reaching right back and they're not just not going to the big mines. They're going in to help some of the artisanal miners to establish these responsible um, supply chains. And I think that's important. Most countries have policies that they, they want to try and um, regularize in some way their small scale mining sectors if they can because they're really important parts of their sustainable development plans so yes most miners in the world are small scale miners it's been estimated that up to 100 million people rely you know families and people who rely on small scale mining for their livelihood but even though most of our metals come out of industrial and large scale mines most of the miners in the world are people on the small scale mines so they've got to be a really important part of the responsible sourcing agenda so absolutely, I agree. Good last question, if that is the last question, because it's one on which we can absolutely all agree today. Thanks, Francis. And the question that I had, you actually already answered. Someone asked the same question I wanted to ask, so thanks for that. <laughs> Just before we wrap up, do we have any more questions? Please do let us know if you have a question and um, we can unmute you. You can unmute yourself so you can ask the final question, Erin. Do we have any question in the chat? No. Nope. I think we're done with the chat. And then uh, YouTube um, is, we asked already the questions from, from the YouTube audience. So uh, with that, I'm just like to say thanks again to, to everybody who joined us today. And, and a really big thank you to, to Francis Wall for, for this leading this discussion uh, that I find quite important. Uh, any last words that you would like to share with us, uh, Francis, about the circular economy, life no. cycle assessment of mines? Well, no, only to say thank you very much for inviting me. I obviously enjoy giving the talk and a really great discussion and great points afterwards. So, yeah, just encourage everybody to go out there and take part in the agenda because I think it's going to be a really important one. And it's obviously one in which lots of us can take part in various ways, whether it's through our geology professional work and research, or as we've seen with the Fairphone example, whether it's us as consumers uh, taking part in responsible sourcing as well. So thanks very much. Really great session today. Enjoyed it. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Take good care of yourself and be safe. Bye-bye. <laughs> thanks so much, Francis. Thanks everybody. Bye. See you next week or next time. <laughs>